Welcome to Wow of True, the podcast of your most digressions. Welcome to Wow of True, the podcast of your wildest memes. We're your one-stop internet culture shop, here to dissect what's going viral, why we care, and how this might affect our real human lives. I'm known mushroom hater, Isabel. And I'm Amanda, and I, I don't know why this is relevant, but I do like mushrooms, want to put that out there. <laughs> Anyone could be famous on the internet, so why not us? It's literally not relevant. I just learned the other day that a couple of friends were making fun of me for hating mushrooms, and I was like, you know what? That's fair. So I would say I'm I'm a known mushroom enjoyer, I would say. <laughs> like, after this podcast, I am probably going to go to the farmer's market and buy some very weird mushrooms. But I understand when people don't like mushrooms, because if you don't cook them well, then they, you just kind of have this, like, squishy fungus. Yeah, it's like a texture thing mostly for me. I'm just kind of like, I am not about this. Yeah. Texturally. And also, I feel like with, Rus- with mushrooms, I almost said Russians, I guess. <laughs> with, with, no, because I was going to say, with mushrooms, it's Russian roulette. And, like, whether when you get them from somewhere, whether they're cooked in a way that's like, this is fine, versus this is texturally unpleasant. So it's easier just to avoid the whole subject altogether. This is the same with Russians. Just kidding. Damn. <laughs> Love and light. <laughs> well, in other news, um, keeping with our countdown, we are now six episodes away from 69. You know, as it gets closer, I'm like, oh God, we're going to really have to make 69 good or else like this countdown will have been so anticlimactic. Yeah. Um, episode 69 is when uh, your favorite meme podcast, Wow of True, explains to you what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. <laughs> Which is what everybody, you know, is desperately wanting to hear from oh, us. Yeah. Um, yeah, the banks have melted down. Uh, you know, like, I feel like a lot of things are melting down this week and last week, and we are kind of just swerving all around it because it's like, we did talk about, like, should we talk about Silicon Valley Bank? Should we talk about finance? Question mark. Yeah, but then the thing is, like, to pull back the curtain, the discussion that we have is, like, are people listening to Wow If True for explanations on Silicon Valley Bank? If it was impacting, like, normal internet people in a weird way, maybe. But I feel like it's just kind of, it's just sort of impacting startups that use the bank to, like, do payroll. Which sucks for, like, random startup employees. But it's getting figured out. It's fine. Yeah, like, I mean, I do think, like, maybe what we could talk about later, and we talked about this Pulling back the curtain even further is that what's interesting is the internet's response to Silicon Valley Bank. But if you're here for, like, serious discussion on, like, how the finance system works, this is actually not the podcast for it, and you should log the fuck off. Yeah, go listen to Equity. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So, hello, the banks have melted down, but you know what else is melting down? Cheese on toast. (laughs) We're talking about a cheese toast Facebook group. Yes. Instead of talking about, like, once-in-a-generation financial meltdowns, cheese toast. Well, this is a a once-in-a-generation cheese toast group, so, you know. Okay. These are equivalent. (laughs) To, To tell the personal story here. So, I like when my friends, or even just listeners of Wow of True Podcast, you are all my friends. I mean parasocially maybe but you, you know what i mean we're, we're buds i like when people tell me about weird things on the internet because i write about weird things on the internet and we have a podcast about weird things on the internet but like it is impossible for one person to just know all of it so to set the scene i am at a restaurant in chinatown that has robots the robots are delivering us our food And my friend Chase, who was on episode two, three, or four of this podcast, I don't remember, says to me, do you know about cheese toast? And I'm like, no. And this has been going on since January, and she only just told me about it, like, a week ago. And I'm, I am pissed, but it's okay. So, the story of cheese toast is that this guy named Scott, who is, like, a 60-year-old retiree, he just retired in July, and he is getting a little stir crazy and he really likes cheese toast which yes that is literally just bread with cheese on it wait i have a question about the cheese toast i have a question about the cheese toast first of all does the cheese have to be like this is gonna sound weird does it have to be raw cheese or like melted cheese i think it's generally toasted i mean i'll get into this more later but i think scott's 
kind of ethos around cheese toast is basically like, I mean, I think in all of these internet food debates, like is a hot dog a sandwich, whatever. It's all about intentionality, if you will. <laughs> and so, wait, which so, <laughs> I said that wait, to so like, I said that to like someone who has not taken like art history classes in college. And they were like, that's a really fancy way of saying intention. And I was like, fuck, but- <laughs> you're so right. But it's also like, I feel like you can't bring that into food items because if you go in with the intention of making a cheese toast, but you do put a second slice of bread on it and you do grill it, you have made a grilled cheese. So, yeah, well, I mean, so from Scott's perspective, like, he wants to be very inclusive of all of the cheese toast posting, but he is very anti-pizza because... He likes pizza personally, but there are a lot of places on the internet for you to, like, talk about pizza. And cheese toast needs its own moment. So basically this guy makes a cheese toast group, and he happens to be someone who, like, he lives in New Jersey and is in a bunch of New Jersey Facebook food groups. So he Mm -hmm. adds some of his New Jersey food group friends, he adds some of his personal friends... And he's really excited because a couple days into this, in January, he has about 100 members, and the only other cheese toast groups on Facebook have, like, 70 members. So he's telling his daughter, who, he has four kids that are, like, adult children, because he's, like, 60. Because he's retired, yes. And his daughter is just very amused by the fact that her dad is like, I have the largest cheese toast group on Facebook. So she posts about this in the group, please show to Jim, ha ha, which if you are not (laughs) initiated, this is a 300,000 person group where people just kind of like make fun of boomers for like how they use the internet. But like some of it is like actively making fun of people and some of it is just like, oh my God, look at this cute old person. And I think this was more of the latter because he's not using Facebook incorrectly. He's just using Facebook in a very wholesome way. Yeah, arguably this is actually the correct way to use Facebook where you create a group for something you're interested in and add people to it. Like that one makes sense. This is, that makes way more sense than please show to Jim, ha ha, <laughs> like conceptually. You know, like there's a couple of la- layers of abstraction that you have to get to. I feel like everything about please show to Jim, ha ha is like conceptualized in the title where it's like, it's mocking, but it's funny. But unless you understand what it's referencing, then it doesn't make sense. Whereas cheese toast, cheese toast is cheese toast. Yeah. I get it. Or I mean, even my friend Chase, who told me about this, like when we had her on the podcast, uh, way back, retro wow of true, she was on the podcast because she is one of the moderators of Lemph Book, which is a group of like several hundred Facebook groups where you're not allowed to use the letter N. Because M is a superior glyph to N because it's longer or longer. <laughs> this is regular. Yeah, so it's just like, like, this is a really big deal on quote unquote weird Facebook, which is just people using Facebook in weird ways. So like, you're used to having things like length book where it's like, you get banned for using the letter N. I mean, not actually, I think you get like some warnings, but like, you know. Um, and then here you just have cheese toast love. That's the name of the group. Cheese Toast Love. I really like that the heading, the header is like a clip art of Cheese Toast too and not like a real photo or something. I just think that's good. No, so there is um, an artist who made that. I unfortunately don't know their name off the top of my head. When I sent Scott my article, he was like, oh, this is great, but I have a correction, which is that the mascot is named Toasty with an I-E and you wrote Toasty with a Y. And I was like, damn, you're so right. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> damn so true but yeah so basically his daughter posts about this and please show to jim ha ha and of course everyone is like well we want to join the cheese toast group so she shares the group and then like thousands of people join it and what scott told me was that he went to visit his dad and his dad is like older and needs help with just various like things as older people do and so he went to fix his dad's tv remote which he was like that is the most panicked my dad can be is his tv remote not working and so he's just like chilling with his dad fixing his tv remote hanging out and then he checks his phone after he leaves and the cheese toast group has like 
2,000 members. And then he was somewhere where his daughter also was. And then she records a video without him knowing where he's like, I have a problem. I'm getting attacked by the cheese toast bots. There's suddenly 2,000 people in the group. How do you go from 200 to 2,000 in two hours? And yeah, he's just very like, I am being attacked by cheese toast bots. And he is confused because these posts look legit. And it turns out it is legit because, like, they are. Like, they're just people from the gym group that are like, yeah, let me share my cheese toast. Basically, this just spirals further and further until now the cheese toast group has, like, 16,000 members. And it's pretty active. There have been meetups, like, in, in Holy like, shit. multiple states. So, like, Chase went to a meetup. And I'm like, how did you not tell me that you went to a meetup? for a Facebook group about cheese toast. Do you know me? But it's fine. It, it's fine. You know, Chase uh, Chase made up for it. We're fine. <laughs> I'm, but, I'm detecting like a little bit of salt here. Just a little bit. Yeah, I mean, it's not a big deal because ultimately I am the first person to uh, cover cheese toast. So I I did get this the scoop, if you will. Um, <laughs> the scoop of cheese. But yeah, so cheese toast is going well. Scott's trying to grow his TikTok. He's also just very cute on TikTok where he's just this guy being like, let me tell you about my cheese toast. So my first comment is that his daughter ex- essentially like doxed his cheese toast goof <laughs> group. Like in a, in a good way, in a positive way. But like essentially that is what she did. Yeah. My second comment is... What is cheese toast? Oh, it's it's literally just like... Is it just like cheese on toast? Like, is there any criteria for this? I think in its purest form, it is cheese on toast. So, like, if you take, like, the shittiest piece of, like, Wonder Bread and, like, a craft Single and toast it, that's cheese toast. But you could also get, like, gourmet sourdough bread and, like, fancy cheese from the farmer's market and then, like, toast that and that's cheese toast. But then you can also, you can put toppings on it. You can put toppings on it. Okay, so see, because that's what I was wondering about, because do you remember on Reddit where there's like a grilled cheese subreddit and there's this one guy who had like a fucking nuclear meltdown about do not put things in your grilled cheese. A grilled cheese is like cheese and bread. And it's like this like multi-paragraph breakdown, like in like a funny way. It's like a similar breakdown to like the Morios guy on Tumblr, if you remember that. I don't (laughs) Or someone is just getting very... Well, it's just the, the concept where someone is getting very vehement about an article of food. Yeah. And this the cheese toast group seems like the opposite of the Reddit grilled cheese group. Do you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. In like their purity of substance, <laughs> of their unadulterated cheese thoughts. I think this is also just because like Scott's intentions in making the group are so pure and the members of the group so far have just kind of followed his lead where like something else that has come up is that there are members in the group that are like, oh, I have an autistic child who doesn't eat that much food and it's hard to like get something they want to eat, but they'll eat cheese toast. Or like, even for me, like, I think a lot about like, when you're really exhausted or really busy or just like not feeling like you are able to feed yourself, what are easy things you can make? And I think cheese toast falls into that because for me, the distinguishing factor between cheese toast and grilled cheese is that with grilled cheese, you are presumably using a pan and then you have to clean the pan. But with cheese toast, if you put it on tinfoil and then put it in the toaster oven, you just throw out the tinfoil. You're good. This is true. That's actually a big consideration here. Yeah. You know, anyway, I'm pro cheese toast. Me too. Speaking of people getting really angry on the internet about really mundane things, can I tell you about, like, a weird hill that I died on, um in like March, 2020. You know, I think we were really all dying on some sort of weird (laughs) hill in March, 2020, but yes, go on. This wasn't that big a deal. I did post a comment in a Facebook group. Basically, Animal Crossing had just come out and people were talking about like manipulating the game to get their favorite villagers. And then if they got a bad villager, they'd be like, I fucking hate that guy. He's so ugly. How do I get rid of him? I'm gonna like hit him with my bug net until he goes away. And then I commented and I was like, these malicious attitudes towards people that look different from you are the same attitudes that lead to discrimination in the real world. 
<laughs> and then I look Jesus. back and I'm like, why was I so upset about people being mean to Animal Crossing villagers? You know, okay, but like, that's not even the weirdest thing <laughs> someone said about Animal Crossing villagers. You remember the whole thing was like, what was, what was the cat's name? Like the cat that people were obsessed with? Like, the, the twink one. The one who's a twink. The one who people were drawing as an anime twink. I think it's Raven. Hold on, let me check. I don't- there's so many Animal Crossing villagers, but- No, give me- give me, like, two seconds. I had not planned on talking about this. Yeah, it's fucking Raymond. No, people were weird about Raymond because it was, like, this- this was a cat that, like, someone had messaged someone else about, like, you- you do not deserve to have him. <laughs> You're not treating him well enough. I do, so you should give him to me. <laughs> Like, people were very weird about the twink business cat. So I guess what I'm saying is, it could have been weird. I just want to state on the record, um, my favorite Animal Crossing villager is Cherry the Punk Doll. That's good. Um, I don't have a favorite Animal Crossing villager because I'm a pleb. You're a well-adjusted adult. I'm a well-adjusted adult who doesn't think about these things. Yeah, but I mean, point being, I think we're just illustrating in our conversation that the internet can be a very weird place where people get angry about, like, how you're treating Animal Crossing villagers. And here you just have a group where people are literally just posting cheese toast. Like, really, like, so far, nothing really has had a meltdown, haha, if you will, in this group. I think it'll stay wholesome. I'm hoping that it stays wholesome. Yeah. But, like, you know what's interesting is that, like, whenever you tell me about weird Facebook in 2023, it reminds me of, like, Tumblr during the era when people were not really using Tumblr. Yeah. AKA, like, three months ago. Yeah. Um, where, where just, like, weirder and weirder subcultures formed because nobody was watching them. Like, like, as if, like, it's as if, like, you look away from the slime mold and then you come back, like, two weeks later and you're like, oh my god, what has grown in my slime mold? <laughs> um, that's how I feel about Facebook in 2023. No, yeah, I mean, like, I barely even use Facebook and I used to be, like, really, really into Facebook groups in the, mm. the golden age, if you will, which we talked with Alex Cohen about in episode about rat verified yeah i mean it's like the people that are still on weird facebook are really dedicated to it i talked to some people about weird facebook and they were like oh yeah cheese toast love is taking off now because people are kind of tired of the whole super ironic like tag group era i guess we, we've moved on from the irony into the post irony era yeah it's like there's like a pendulum swinging between when are you super ironic and when are you not and i think right now we're in a not super ironic era do you think that's kind of true for culture as a whole because i feel like people got very into wellness and like i feel like when people do that that means it's swinging back into the non-ironic era do you know what i mean you might have a point, but I just see wellness as its whole separate thing where it's like, I mean, I, I do just believe that wellness is like a multi-billion dollar industry that is like selling particularly women on the idea that they're not good enough. <laughs> but, right. But like, you know, you know what I mean by like the packaging of like what we're packaging for the culture? Like, like it, when it turns into like, I think we were in like an unironic era where it was talking about like wellness and spirituality and all that shit. And like, you know, do you know what I mean? Like that sort of stuff has like an unironic flavor where it's like, let's actually fix, let's fix you versus the I irony flavor, which is the let's poison our bodies. And like, actually, arguably, we might be sliding back into the irony era because like Y2K fashion is back. And I think Y2K, yeah. in retrospect, was one of the peak irony moments, um, which I did not understand because I was four. Same. <laughs> um, well, also, I mean, when you say, like, poisoning ourselves, I don't want to get into this discourse, but do you mean, like, Ozempic? Well, I mean, I was thinking about that. I think Ozempic is actually more of the the wellness. I think Ozempic is in the wellness camp. Do you know what I mean? Where it's being sold as, like, this will fix your body? Yeah, because then again, a lot of these wellness things, like the dusts or whatever, it's like, like, or like celery juice. I don't know. Listen to maintenance phase, guys. <laughs> No, but like, that's what I mean. It's like, this is all like an unironic thing as opposed to an ironic thing where it's like, this is actually supposed to fix you versus like the, like, is it cool to do, is, is, is it cool to do cocaine or is it cool to drink green juice? That's, that's, I guess the distinction I'm making here. I mean, the thing is that I often think that the green juice and the cocaine people are the same people. No, but like, what I mean is that like, what is the culture telling you is cool? Like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, is it cool? Like, I'm talking more about like how like non-alcoholic wines are a thing now. Oh yeah. V versus... Let's drink a lot of wine. Yeah. Well, I'm just curious, like, what would you define as ironic wellness? I, th th that's what I'm saying is that I don't think there is, okay. like, the wellness industry, I think, is an 
is in the non-ironic camp, if that makes sense. I gotta make a chart. Where's Roshan when I need him? I mean, I guess maybe ironic wellness would be, like, hot girl walks. Yeah, like, hot girl walks would be ironic wellness. But I'm, but I mean more just that, like, the wellness industry is selling you something based on the idea that it will work, not that it will not work. Yeah, for sure. But then I think on TikTok you see, like, quote-unquote, I guess if we wanted to talk about ironic wellness, what it would be is stuff like people making playlists of Marina and the Diamonds for your hot girl walk. Yeah. Like, that's ironic wellness. But, like, the idea of wellness is unironic versus the idea of, like, um, I'm trying to think. I'm trying to think of a good, like, counterexample to that, but I can't think of anything right now, so maybe we'll come back to this unless you have thoughts. Yeah, well, for the uninitiated, mainly my mom who listens to this podcast, the hot girl walk is, like, you're depressed and you don't want to do anything, but you know that if you go for a walk, then you'll feel better. So it's ironic because it's, like, uh, like, the hot girl walk implies it's, like, you have your shit together. Like, you are so good. You're going on this hot girl walk. You're wearing your hot exercise clothes. You're looking great. But in reality, I guess I think of hot girl walk as, like, god damn it. I, I feel like shit, and I know that I need to just go on a walk, and I'll feel, like, marginally better. See, because I thought that hot girl walks were, like, unironic, where it's, like, okay, yeah, I'm going to do this thing, and it will fix me. I don't know. Which I guess is, like, maybe just a distinction in what irony means to the individual maybe i don't know we're getting off topic this is like the uh, the rorschach test of the hot girl walk where i see it as like god damn it i have to take care of myself and i'll feel better because <laughs> that's where i'm at <laughs> i mean i also don't go on hot girl walks despite thinking i should probably go on a hot girl walk so you know how it is yeah also yeah the o- ozempic stuff is like mad dystopian oh yeah that's all i have to say about that it's it sucks everyone should go read the pill by meg ellison because it, it pretty much predicted this yeah like, two years ago. Everyone go read Aubrey Gordon's books. My emotional support, Aubrey Gordon. <laughs> Welcome to Wow of True, the podcast of your most digressions. Yeah, see, exactly. I mean, people are here to talk, to, like, they want us to talk about Animal Crossing and D&D characters. They're not here to learn about why Silicon Valley Bank went kaput. Well, too fucking bad, because we're ta- going to talk about Silicon Valley Bank real quick, because I think it would be interesting to talk about Twitter's attitude towards Silicon Valley Bank disintegrating. What I thought was really interesting about this from a cultural perspective is that, at least from what I was seeing on Twitter, because I follow a lot of tech people and I follow a lot of, like, people who hate tech. Hm. This is These are both directly because of you, Amanda, by the oh, way. Oh, no, me too. And one of the interesting things I saw was, first of all, people being like, haha, suck at startups, and then startups being like, but please, I am just a little guy. But then also startups being like, oh, shit. Everybody hates us. Why does everyone hate us? And I just thought that was a really interesting cultural moment tied to this financial situation. Yeah. So basically, when banks are FDIC insured, it's like if something goes down, you can get up to $250,000 back, which like probably like 99.9 percent of people don't have over two hundred fifty thousand dollars in their bank i mean that's i made up that statistic don't quote me the majority of americans the majority of americans do not have more than 250k in the bank if you have more than that congratulations on your good fortune or you're a company yeah and i mean that's the problem is i genuinely like don't feel bad for people like individuals that had more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars in a bank because like I don't care. Like, you're not my priority in terms of, like, people in the world that I care about. But, I mean, if you're a company, I actually have a bit more sympathy because people that work for startups aren't inherently, like, tech bros. Like, there are normal people that work for startups, and if they're not able to, like, get paid because their company's bank, like, lost all of its money, then that kind of sucks. But this is, like, a non-issue anyway because they're getting, like, bailed out, essentially. Yeah, like, it doesn't actually matter because everyone is, like, all the, like, Biden was like, yeah, okay, your deposits are good. We're just gonna, like, you're you're all good. Mm -hmm. Like, that was the gist of what he said, and that's just the gist of what's happening because they're trying to avoid Financial Crisis 2, the sequel to 2008, you know? Financial Crisis 2, Electric Boogaloo. (laughs) Two financial, two two crisis. Two... (laughs) <laughs> no, this is what the this is what the listeners are here for. Yeah. Unironically. I kind of 
disagree with you because I actually do have sympathy for people who have more than 250k in the bank because like sometimes that's like people who have like retirement accounts and stuff. Okay. On the other hand, I'm kind of like you shouldn't don't put all of your money in one bank account. It's two, it's 2023. Just don't do that. Like either way. This is not financial advice. I have significantly less money than that. And I have multiple bank accounts. So like, what are these people doing? How many bank accounts do I have? I have one. It's not 250k. <laughs> I love how we're like, people don't listen to this podcast because they want to hear us talk about banks. And then now we're like, here are our personal finance takes from two people that are not you know, qualified I... to give you financial advice. This is not financial advice. And this is not legal advice. It, it is not legal advice. I am super qualified. I don't know what to tell you. I have 230k in debt. Um... <laughs> But you also this have is, a job that makes school. you well equipped to deal with that debt. My job also does pay me so many dollars, but not enough dollars to pay off the debt very fast. I do have one piece of financial advice that I am going to say is legitimate financial advice, which is that you should go to wowtrue.com slash merch and buy our t-shirt that says, just kill them, this is not legal advice. It is also available <laughs> as a mug. Shockingly, that is our best-selling item thus far, the the just kill them, this is not legal advice design. And I don't know what that says about us. It, it means that I never lose with my graphic design skills. Exactly. Um, and also, it's it's a good mug, it's a good shirt, you won't regret it, it will not depreciate in value. It has no ties to Silicon Valley Bank. Yeah. <laughs> Incredible. Wait, I have a picture, I have a piece of actual legal, of actual financial advice for our listeners. And that is that you should open a credit card when you're younger and not use it for anything except, like, buying gas and, like, incidentals, like, random shit, like, buying yourself a Coke or something. Because the earlier you open a credit card and the earlier you establish a credit history, the easier it will be to, like, deal with, like, credit scores later. Because you'll have a good credit history. And nobody tells you that when you're 16. I think it's actually really girl boss of us to be talking about finance when we don't know shit about finance, because that's also what a lot of white male finance influencers do. And speaking of white male finance <laughs> influencers, there is a lawsuit, a class action lawsuit in which this guy who was an investor in FTX is suing a bunch of YouTubers who partnered with FTX over like He's basically alleging that they were promoting securities without adequately disclosing that they were promoting securities. But then it's just a whole mm -hmm. mess of legal things that are confusing. And I'm curious what your thoughts are. Okay, so first off, this is not legal advice. I am not a litigator. Honestly, okay, my hot take about this is that most secu like securities law stuff is pretty boring. Yeah. And I'm saying that as someone who does like fi legal finance shit. You know what's like mad funny is that like I I technically work in an industry adjacent to fin to finance and banking and stuff and me and my coworkers were like yeah what the fuck is going on with Silicon Valley Bank like we didn't know um this is because we're idiots in our 20s sometimes yeah do not quote me on that um they're very smart but I think the interesting thing here is that I mean I don't even know if this is like an interesting thing to say but it's like it kind of shows how much of this shit is like on technicalities yeah um because it's basically I feel like this is similar to a lot of lawsuits where somebody is just kind of like, damn, I would like my money back. What are the weird little nitpicky things I can grab someone on? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what's going on here. That was kind of my read of the situation. And when I read, like when I skimmed the, the documents attached to the article, I was kind of just like, this is clearly just you want your money back and you're trying to slap people with whatever you can, which I think is a lot of lawsuits because mm -hmm. in America, as long as you have money, you can sue anyone for anything. This is not, that that's not actually true, but it is sort of true. Yeah. The other thing is that like, I think we're seeing here like a lot of, just from like a cultural standpoint, like this is not like a legal standpoint at all. It's this is just kind of where a lot of like crypto shit and a lot of like fringe finance stuff was basically running along as if it was like, not regulated and i mean it wasn't regulated in a lot of places and also it was running along as if like oh nothing can catch me and then eventually the long arm of the law does catch up and people start being like when start things start to break bad everybody wants protection which is kind of the same thing that happened with not not to tie everything together but that to, but to do that because yo people fucking love it when you do that which kind of happened with silicon valley bank where as long as shit was going good everyone's like yeah we're libertarians it's great <laughs> and then they're like oh no mommy <laughs> um regulation yeah um so that's that's my only takes on this 
Yeah, I think the natural conclusion of libertarianism is, oh no, mommy, regulation. (laughs) Exactly. Yeah, I mean, I think you are correct that this is just a guy trying to get money back because the lawsuit's plaintiff is this guy named Edwin Garrison, and he is the same guy who filed a lawsuit suing, like, celebrity celebrities like Tom Brady, Shaquille O'Neal, Larry David... Kevin O'Leary, which it is the most Larry David possible thing that Larry David is being sued for promoting FTX. Because if you recall correctly, Larry David did a Super Bowl commercial with FTX in 2022, where it was just Larry David, like, in historical moments around key inventions where he was like, the light bulb, eh, it's not going to catch on. And it was like, oh, the dishwasher, but I can just put my dishes in the shower. And then it's him being like, crypto... Eh, I'll pass. So, like, the whole commercial is about Larry David being skeptical of crypto, and now he's getting sued for promoting crypto. Wait, that's <laughs> that's really good, actually. And it's just like, if you have seen any episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm, like, this is the most Larry David-ass shit that could ever happen to Larry David, and I think it's very funny. Yeah, but so, like... <laughs> I mean, the thing with FTX, which I think we did discuss on the podcast, basically massive crypto exchange that turned out to be doing many fraud and now went Mm -hmm. poof and a lot of people got fucked over. Yeah, and then like they're not immediately getting their money back to my understanding, whereas Mm -hmm. bank people are. But yeah, I mean, that's the problem with being a libertarian who's like, yeah, haha, no regulation, and then poof, all your money's gone. (laughs) It's almost as if corporate interests have captured this country's, um, you know, laws. No no comments there. Hey. Hey. But yeah, so like, It's basically the same lawsuit that in one lawsuit, this guy is suing a bunch of influencers. And then in another lawsuit, he's suing a bunch of celebrities that did commercials. And there are actual like FTC guidelines for social media influencers, which that's why you see people doing like hashtag sponsored, hashtag ad, because if you receive money for something, you are legally required to disclose that. So, like, if I get gifted a fancy candle from a fancy candle company and then they pay me X amount of money to post about it, I have to say, like, I was paid to do this. Right. And, like, this is a good, this is a good thing. Yeah. This is a good regulation to have. This is a good law. Like, the idea is that it helps detract from fraudulent advertising because maybe this candle fucking sucks ass and then... I'm there and I'm like, this candle kicks ass and people trust me because I'm, I'm amazing. And they, I'm, damn, that was the most, uh, see, I can't even say I'm amazing as a joke without being like, well, what does that mean? Um, anyway, I, I just went down <laughs> okay. the whole thing. Um, are, are you good? <laughs> no. Um, okay. If I promote a candle that sucks and I don't say that I was paid to promote it and the candle sucks, then I'm in trouble. And it's even more troublesome when you are promoting a security because then there are more guidelines around, like, how much you have to be like, yo, this is a security, this is, like, a financial thing, I'm not a finance person, I'm just Kim Kardashian. So last year, Kim Kardashian was, um, she settled with the FTC by paying them $1.26 million dollars, because they said that she did not properly disclose that she was paid to promote Ethereum Max's Emax token, which, like, I feel like I know more about crypto than the average person, and, like, I have never heard of Ethereum Max until this thing, so, like... Yeah, I'm like, what the fuck is Ethereum Max? Yeah, like, like, I've heard of Ethereum, This but... is nothing. It, it is nothing. But if you're getting paid to promote a security, then you also have to say how much you were paid. So Kim Kardashian would have to say, I was paid $250,000 to promote this. And she did Mm -hmm. not. She just did, like, hashtag ad in the corner. And then she got fined $1.26 million. So the, the argument that I think this guy is trying to make, which it's hard to even say what the argument is because he really is just, like, charging on a bunch of random counts and like throwing shit at the wall and hoping them that they stick yeah no that's how i interpret it too i mean but that's like classic lawsuits shit right like you're just especially if it's like in a weird area i think that a really common tactic at least when i read cases is that the guy will try and like slap like five things like five to ten things there and hope that one of these will work (laughs) because like you know why not yeah and like i think that's why like i was very confused reading this lawsuit at first because on one hand like one of the things that he was trying to call them on was like 
they didn't disclose that they were getting paid by FTX. And I'm like, they did, though. Like, they were like, this video was sponsored by FTX. Like, what more do you want? Mm-hmm. But but then, like, I think that then that gets into legal techno- te- technicalities of what, like, disclosed means. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, like I feel like every time when somebody is bringing a lawsuit, it's really not, like, the plain English version of what this is actually happening. Like, what is actually happening. It's It's the... We're playing a game here, and all of the words mean something a little bit different and basically have been defined by courts in the past. So you're trying to make sure that what you're arguing is, like, matching to a past circumstance. Does that make sense? Yeah, and I mean, this is all speculation, because we don't know what's going to happen with this case, but it is kind of, like, generally I wouldn't cover Guy Sue's Guy, but, like, this is kind of a bigger deal because it is setting up like more of a precedent for how influencers can be held accountable for these sorts of things. And in context of what happened with Kim Kardashian, I think that it is relevant. (laughs) In the context of Kim Kardashian. Oh yeah, of course. (laughs) Yeah, sorry, go on. My interpretation is that ultimately the question is, is FTX a security? And I don't know if, I don't think it is because FTX is just like an exchange. So it's like, you could say Google stock is a security, but that doesn't mean that like Robinhood or Acorns or any of those apps are securities. Well, like the interesting thing here is that the court could be like, yeah, yeah, probably. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that, like the court could define whatever it wants, however it wants. And it would be interesting if they decided to define it as a security. I mean, like part of this, I think, is trying to set precedent for other crypto stuff. Do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like, I think that might be why it's interesting because it's like, oh shit, like how is crypto going to be treated by the legal system? Because I don't think people think that the legal system is going to treat crypto well. Also like the crypto bubbles over and everyone's kind of like (laughs) soured on it. Do you know what I mean? So there's a lot of, I think, cultural anxiety within that space around that. Um, That's just speculation. I don't really deal with crypto anymore. Like honestly, I feel like AI is the new crypto. Oh yeah, for sure. In the sphere of influence it holds in people's minds. Yeah. Speaking of AI, keeping on the law theme, I had an AI training at work. Incredible. Which is like a crazy thing to be doing to begin with. Because it's like, let's talk, like literally I had a ChatGPT3 training at work before ChatGPT4 was announced, like two days before. Um, And it was basically a, how should we integrate ChatGPT3 into our workflow? Or like, how do you, like, here's the stuff you can do with it. And here's the stuff you can't. Obviously a lot of it was very like, it made sense. It was like, don't put any client information in because... This isn't something that belongs to us. This is a different company. Yeah. It was also stuff like just double check that what you're getting as the output is right Mm -hmm. because ChatGPT3 hallucinates a lot. And so, but but they were very encouraging of like, let's experiment to find ways to make this work into our workflow. The other interesting thing thing here was that like, I think a lot of law firms are not worried about AI stealing their jobs as much as they are worried about other firms using AI before them. Interesting. So I think there is kind of a race of how do we integrate this into our system without like it fucking breaking everything and without it being illegal while still being faster than the other guy. There's a little bit of that going on, but there's also a little bit of like lawyers are kind of dinosaurs in how they work. Yeah. Nobody likes using a new system. During the training, there were a lot of people just like not really understanding tech, (laughs) which was kind of funny for me specifically. So then obviously I did start trying it out at work and I found some like really interesting stuff about the way that it was completely fucking useless for me. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> because what I was really surprised about is that when you ask it to do legal stuff, because I was doing some research for somebody and I was basically sticking in a bunch of questions and asking it to quote case law and being like, can you please summarize, you know, like it was stuff that I don't know a lot about because it was a topic I was researching in and I thought that, okay, so maybe if ChatGPT3 is pulling from the internet, odds are someone else has looked this up before odds are that this will, if I put in the right strings and I put in the right keywords, maybe it'll come up with something close to accurate that I can use as a jumping off point. Does that seem like a reasonable assumption? That seems like a reasonable assumption to me. Yeah, but I think it sounds like the problem that you're running into, which is a problem that I would run into if I were trying to use AI in my work, is that you're spending as much time double checking its work as you would if you just do it yourself. And what you do yourself yeah. is mm-hmm. probably going to be better quality research and writing than what an AI can do because we are trained professionals with jobs that require a lot of training and professional skills. 
Right. So no, because so here's what's interesting. Here's what actually happened. So the first question I'm asking it, I was asking about whether the specific law exists in New York and whether it can work. It spit out a beautifully coherent answer that quoted the case law that gave me a list of cases that were properly cited and stuff. And then I was like, this seems reasonable. I go to look it up. Here's what I find in the actual legal database. First of all, it's quoting to real cases. It is completely making up the content of them oh my God. every single time. <laughs> but it would do it in such a coherent manner because I asked ChatGPT the question a few different times in that one like in that one like session, and it would do it in a very coherent manner in very similar ways every time. And then I was like, okay, so maybe this actually exists. So then I go look it up. These cases exist. Their content is completely different. Like they're not even in the same field. The second thing is that like it completely made up the law that I was looking for wholesale. This doesn't exist in New York. Like the concept I was looking for is actually illegal in New York. Mm. You can't do it. And ChatGPT was like, oh yeah, you can do this. Here's all the concepts. And what it was doing was pulling concepts from different states. But the fact that it wasn't like, dude, I don't know or something like that. The fact that ChatGPT will just give you an answer was very much, was sort of surprising to me. And I guess this is like not super interesting unless you work in the legal industry, but that's fine. What was also interesting is that like, so then I was like, okay, this is actually kind of an interesting phenomenon that's happening. Let me try it again in different sessions. And it was doing different variations of the same sort of shit that it was giving me the first time with different case law that none of which existed <laughs> every single time. Yeah. And so I was like, wow, you're useless. Yeah. And I mean, that's what we're talking about when we talk about AI hallucinating is it just kind of makes mm -hmm. up shit and presents it as though it's true. And then if you're using this in like a context with any stakes at all, you need to make sure what it's saying is true. And I mean, even like, I like, I mean, as I've played around with it just as like, I mean, I've written about it, so I should play around with it. And I had done things like write 10 headlines that would appear on a technology blog. And it would be like, Google acquires Apple. And it's like, that didn't happen. <laughs> Which, I mean, if that happened, yeah, it's like this is that would be fucking crazy. I don't think it would, um, I don't think the, that the SEC would allow that to happen, but, like, that would be fucking crazy. But that's not gonna happen. That would get that fucking her HSR'd real fast. Lena Khan would be like, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> yeah, she'd be like, absolutely not. Halloween costume, FTC chair Lena Khan. Real specific. <laughs> <laughs> And then you have two friends dressed up as Apple and Google and you shove them apart all night. Um, but in reality, this... <laughs> wait, no, that's really... Wait, no, okay. Um, you have two friends dressed up as Microsoft and Activision Blizzard. <laughs> wait, that's good. God, we're this so This is a very funny. specific podcast. Oh, <laughs> yeah, no, so that was my ChatGPT3 experience for like the legal industry where I realized that this won't work. My job is safe for at least another year. <laughs> But like, okay, what, what it made me worried about is that integrating this into a search engine now suddenly seemed like an even worse idea than it already did. Yeah. So that, that's where I ended up on that. Don't use ChatGPT3 to look up legal stuff. I guess that's all I've got for you. Yeah. So then GPT4 got released, which is, you know, it's more sophisticated than GPT3, as its name would suggest. There was, like, a tweet that went viral, ironically, from a Wharton professor, which for us specifically is very funny. And it is a screenshot from the research behind GPT-4 that shows how GPT-4 performed on standardized tests like SAT, LSAT, GREs, AP exams, Sommelier exams... Which, okay. Wait, yeah, can we talk about the sum sum of the A's? Why, why is that there? there? <laughs> why did the score so high? Contextually, ChatGPT4 scored so high on the sum of the exam. It can't taste. It can't smell. It doesn't have organs. But, like, I haven't looked it up. Okay, like, like, presumably it's just, like, a written test, but what? Okay, I need to look up. What is the intro Somalia exam? <laughs> well, so it is administered by the Court of Master Somaliers. What? There's a court of math? Who are they? I think, okay, so one of us needs to become a certified Somalia. Obviously, this is the next step for Wow True. Yeah, I wonder how much it costs. It probably costs so much money, but I just want to know. All right, here's a course in Philadelphia. Okay. It's um, on April 19th at a steakhouse. It is 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. The, the test to get certified is $650. Oh 
Holy shit. Okay, um, everybody subscribe to Wow of True on Patreon so we can have enough money so one of us can go take the sommelier exam. Oh my god. I mean, it's like that Parks and Rec episode where April just makes up things and then passes, but... Damn. So yeah, I, mean, I feel like one of us could do that. I think we could do that. Apparently, ChatGPT can, but that's not the point. I just think it's extremely funny that it took a sommelier exam of all things. But people are freaking out because it is scoring in like the 90th percentile on SATs. But I don't think that matters. No. Yeah. Like we've talked about this a little bit, but like this really just speaks to how perhaps exams are bullshit. Like it also scored very high on the LSAT and the bar exam. And that's what my friends have been talking about because lawyers Mm -hmm. and the general consensus there is that, yeah, both of these things are kind of bullshit. We don't care that much. Yeah. And like my theory also is that at least for exams of this nature I've taken, like SATs and AP exams, there are so many practice tests online. Like the College Board will put up like, here was the AP exam from 2010, and you can like do it as practice. Right, like it's not surprising that like the AI is able to scrape all the data that people have put online because people put a lot of data online about these tests because they're worried about it. Mm -hmm. What is very funny though is that the only AP that it failed is AP English Language and AP English Literature. Hell yeah, Hell English yeah. major supremacy, yeah. let's go. We can read things critically, like lawsuits. What I really like about this is that there's no improvement yeah. from any of the like versions of GPT 3, 3.5, 4, 4 with no vision, and then 4, which are listed here. Like, most of these things show a significant improvement over time, or at least slight improvement. Solid twos. Solid twos for AP Lit and Lang. It does not get better. It does not learn. Yes. Like, I'm anthropomorphizing it a little bit, but, like, it doesn't learn. The same... I guess the same thing happened for AP World History, but it started out with a four there, so I don't think that counts. Yeah. Like, for example, the AP Chemistry exam... On GPT 3.5, it got a two, and then on GPT 4, it got a four. And like, okay, yeah, like there was improvement there, but it's twos all the way down. It got a solid five all the way through for AP Psych. What does this say about Psych? As someone who got a five on the AP Psych exam and did skip class a bit more than uh, one should, it's just all I'm going to say there. (laughs) But have you seen the discourse online about people being like, oh, maybe it's not the tech workers who are safe it is, and the knowledge workers who are safe in the coming robot apocalypse, it is people with like critical thinking skills who were like, you know, fucking English majors and shit like that. Yeah. And can I just say that I feel so vindicated? I feel so fucking vindicated. Oh, yeah. I, I fucking love this. Um, yeah, I mean, I also think there's a lot of discourse around like, will students just cheat in schools now? And I also, I feel a bit like, sucks to suck like at american education system you brought this upon yourself the problem with u.s education is that everything is dictated by standardized tests and teachers are discouraged from teaching outside of the standardized test and then also it's like students aren't going to be motivated to actually do their work instead of using online tools that maybe give them shortcuts because they're just not motivated because they are disillusioned by school And teachers aren't motivated to make their students not disillusioned by school because they're all being paid, like, barely enough to survive. Like, $4. Yeah, they're all being paid $4 and, like, getting... Like, it's specifically $4. (laughs) No, I mean, but... We treat public education teachers in this country like shit, and we can't really blame them for not, like, going above and beyond to, like reach the kids or whatever like most public school teachers are simply just like how do i pay for like my cavity filling because they can't because they get paid nothing there's a larger issue here which is as a social contract around education is broken Mm -hmm. throughout both like the the like grade school and then college level where you can't have it both ways where this is both a business and something like that's supposed to teach people stuff Do you know what I mean? Where it's like, of course a student is like, what I'm learning doesn't matter, getting the grade matters, or like just getting through it matters, just, you know, getting over it matters. Or like, 
this is like a piece of paper that will be in like an undergraduate and graduate level is like this is a piece of paper that will be useful to me later it is not actually anything that i'm doing that actually matters like i you know i get it i mean like you shouldn't cheat but i get it mm -hmm. um and then on the flip side it's like the issue is that like okay well like teachers aren't a paid enough professors you know we could talk about like the gutting of the university system and like too many administrators blah 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 like there's there's issues here like what i'm saying is that ai is only exacerbating an existing problem yes. it is not something new yeah like it, it it is shining a light on the fact that yeah dude all of this is broken in some fundamental ways at this point yeah for sure i will say that i don't think we're as bad as like asia is though i mean i guess i have not experienced that i i only experienced it for um i think like one month when i was four years old <laughs> in preschool and then a kid was mean to me and hit me with something. And then my mom was like, we're not doing this anymore. Aw. Um, but they did give me candy. Very funny because now I literally have a podcast where I talk too much about like nothing. But um, I had a problem in preschool in which I wouldn't talk. <laughs> Can't imagine. No. Yeah. Okay. I see it. <laughs> like I was just like afraid to talk. And then I would go home and be like, I said a word today. And I also <laughs> didn't... <laughs> I also didn't take naps. Wait, that's really cute. Well, because, like, I talked at home. Oh, I didn't take naps either. Oh, yeah. I mean, what does that say about us? That, like, like it would be, like, nap time <laughs> in preschool, and I'd be like, no. And then the teachers would, like, do puzzles with me. And I'm like, damn, these teachers just, like, they also were just underpaid people that just wanted to, like, take a break. And, like, I was going to say look at their phone, but I don't think there was really mobile phones when we were in preschool. Yeah, yeah they didn't have phones. There weren't really mo mobile phones. So, you know, like, honestly, maybe that was the best thing they could be doing with their time is doing a puzzle. All right, you. now I don't feel bad anymore. <laughs> yeah, see, see, there you fucking go. We've solved it. Um, I would read books during, during nap time instead of napping. You know, okay, so I had the weirdest experience studying for AP Lit and Lang, which was that there was no AP Lit and Lang, like, classes. Interesting. I don't know if it's, like, normal to have, like, AP Lit and, like, AP English, if that makes sense. The elephant in the room is that you went to private high school and I didn't. <laughs> Okay, no, dude. Yeah, so I went to private high school, and, like, first of all, it was a very good school district, so I don't actually know why I needed to go, why I ended up going to private school other than testing in when I was, like, 13 or something. And before that, I went to public school, and before that, I went to an international school in Korea. This is the Isabel lore, if I have not brought this up on the podcast. It is interesting to talk to you about this, because you have experienced, like, every aspect of education. Yeah, you know what else I did? I did Montessori, too, when I was three. Damn, <laughs> I, I'm jealous. <laughs> Yo, Montessori kind of fucked because you can kind of just do whatever you want all day, except it, it's like, you know, it's an educational shit, but it's like educational shit when you're three is like, learn how to tie a knot. Yeah. Highlights about Montessori. They teach you cursive before regular writing. I don't know why, but they also teach you to read when you're like three or four. I learned how to read when I was three without Montessori. Um... I only know this because of the aforementioned cursive, because I look back on my time and I'm like, why did I know cursive? <laughs> Um, which leads to the- because like if they're teaching you to write, then I guess they're teaching you how to read. I think that's how that works. I don't actually remember most of this. The third thing is that I had one friend and then he moved away. And then that's when I learned that you should have more than one friend or else you'll get fucked. <laughs> Damn. That's fucked His up. name was Winston and if you're out there, hi, I know you moved to New York because my mom told me that. <laughs> I, I feel like I had something- oh wait, I was gonna say like what happened was my AP Lit Lang experience because I thought it was pretty unhinged. Yes. The way that AP Lit and Lang worked at my high school was that there was no class for it. You couldn't take, like, AP English. They just didn't have it. So what people would do instead is, like, the, I think the semester before the class was that, like, one of the teachers ran a before-class workshop for AP Lin Lang, like, three times a week or something that started at, like, 6.30 or 7 in the morning. Oh, God. Something like that. Like, which is, like, I guess that's, like, you know, that's high school, right? Like, and so it would be, like, everyone who's, like, a gunner about things, like, everyone who's, like, a little bit too aggro, who's horny for it, who wants to do well on it, who is thinking about taking the AP Lit and Lang exams, despite there not being a class for AP Lit and Lang, in this room, while, like, Mr. Keating would just, like, ex go through, basically, old exams. But also, he would always get really off track, because Mr. Keating was unhinged. Because, you know, I feel like to be an English teacher in high school, you are kind of unhinged. Oh, yeah. That, that was my AP Lit Lang experience, and I got fives on both, so it did work. Yeah. However, I had to get up really early for it. <laughs> I don't know. My school just had AP Lit and Lang classes, and I took them. <laughs> and, yeah. To clarify, like, I think everything else you could take at my school was regular. This was just the one weird guy. Yeah. So, I, okay, I will end on a legitimately funny story. So, in 2019, I was working at Penn, and in our job, we, like, very tangentially like worked with pen admissions like 
I would give tours of the writer's house, which is like a writing thing at Penn, to prospective students that were interested in writing. And I would just like talk to these stressed out 18 year olds and just be like, hey, it's chill. Like, you'll you'll be fine, it, it, whatever. And so as a result, we got invited to the Penn admissions holiday party. And it was at a very good taco place with very good margaritas. So then me and two other people from work were like, well, yeah, of course we're going to go. We want the like free margaritas and tacos because we're all underpaid and like, fuck yeah. And then so we go there and we walk in and before we could even get a free taco or a free margarita, suddenly the Penn admissions officers who outside of work have their own acapella group start performing acapella <laughs> what? at the distrito. That's really good. At the distrito. No, not at the distrito. That's really funny. In the distrito. Acapella in my distrito. <laughs> right in front of my margarita. We gotta end this episode. We got it. Okay. Anyway, we haven't, we talked about some books. So what's our bookshop.org like affiliate code again? No, bookshop.org slash wow of true. And the Libro FM is if you use code WOW at checkbook, you get two audiobooks for the price of one. Yep. So, you know, if any of that sounds interesting to you, go check it out. Also, we have merch. You should buy the the shirt. It's really good. Just kill them. It's not legal advice. I use a mug for coffee fucking constantly. I'm going to unironically buy another sweatshirt because I wear the sweatshirt all the fucking time. If you like this episode, tell a friend. Word of mouth is how we grow. Thank you to all of our patrons and shout out specifically to Zoe, Bray, Andre, Thea, Brian, Gabriel, Lada, Matt, Max, and Aaron's husband. If you want your name in the above or in our Twitter header, slide right into our Patreon at patreon.com slash wowtrue. Shout out to audio editors Allison Mills and David Newtown, graphic designer and Canva warlock Eric Silver who made our logo, Sam Reiser who made our podcast music, and Tessa Farrow who is transcribing our episodes. You can find us on Twitter as at wowtrue. True Pod and Instagram and Facebook as at Wow of True. How do your 15 seconds of internet fame? Slide right into our Twitter DMs and tell us about it. And until next time, let's get weird on the internet.